students, but there will be a burden of paying interest. I've heard of uh, students who have tens of thousands of dollars in, in student loans, and they've been paying them off for 20 years, and they still owe tens of thousands of dollars in student loans. Uh, the interest rates are, are crippling, uh, especially people just entering the workforce. So um, interest-free loans to start immediately. Um, loan forgiveness. Um, I'm not quite sure where that threshold is. I think something in the neighborhood of ten thousand um, dollars. But so those uh, loans in excess of that would be forgiven. I'm not quite sure if that would take place immediately. Then the long-term goal is to have um, zero tuition post-secondary education altogether. An interesting statistic that is probably no longer true, but um, in the uh, last election there was a talk of um, legalizing cannabis, and it was estimated that the revenue from cannabis would just about equal the cost of providing zero tuition for post-secondary institutions. Now, it turns out the, uh, the way that cannabis legalization has been handled, government actually suffered a loss. In, and that, so that, that didn't happen. But if the uh, Green Party were to um, manage that, uh, there's revenue available from things like cannabis sales, from things like um, taxing the, the uh, corporations, the, uh, the wealthy, to make tuition available. And it's an investment. It's not a cost. Uh, a lot of people will see that, you know, there's money going to come from how, how much can we afford to, uh, to do this? Well, you can't afford not to do it. Either. A lot of people who aren't able to take advantage of post-secondary education, even with the current loans, because you know, the, their economic situation just isn't uh, in a place where they can take four, five, six, ten years to get that education, which would benefit them in the long run. But the short-term, uh, their, their, their short-term um, situations are such that they can't afford to you know, leave a job that they might have already. So. Uh, if tuition were uh, not an issue, that would certainly help. And then in addition to that, uh, the Green Party wants to institute a guaranteed livable income so that everybody would get, um, on a monthly basis, enough income to live. It would vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, so Toronto would, more, would have a larger guaranteed livable income because living is more expensive than, say, Vancouver would. But um, that would then let people have the give people the income to survive while they're attending the school, which would then not cost anything extra with the, uh, the zero tuition. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say it's free because it's certainly not free. It has to be paid from someplace. Mm -hmm. so that's why I use the term zero tuition, and it's not coming out of the pocket of the students themselves. And thank you for making that distinction. I think um, it's easy to read one thing on a platform, but it's it's good to hear a little more specificity within. I can't speak as well. So, still within the post-secondary sector mm -hmm. and on this topic, um, there remains a 22% university attainment gap between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. How will the Green Party aim to diminish this gap? I'm not quite sure what an attainment gap is. It's a word. Um, so it refers to the amount of Indigenous students who are actually receiving um, post-secondary oh, um, okay. education. Um, so the amount of students who are enrolled okay. as opposed to um, the amount of Indigenous students. Just the proportionality of, yes. of Indigenous people uh, compared to the Indigenous student population. Yes. Um, I see, we see that everywhere. We see that um, Indigenous people are disadvantaged in, in every um, sector. You know, in, uh, in, the workforce in um, in uh, the CXOs, you know, the, uh, the executive officers in in, uh, in parliament, in, uh, in government, uh, in every situation, the indigenous people are underrepresented, except in incarceration where they're overrepresented. So it's it's a huge, huge issue, and I think um, it, it comes down to you know racism and discrimination. The Green Party wants to implement the, uh, the UNGRIP, the United Nations um, uh, Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, and get those, um, get those recommendations implemented immediately. Canada has already signed on to do that, but hasn't actually followed through in, in, in action to, uh, to make it so. 
Green Party wants to do that. I don't know if you had a look at the Green Party platform, but the very first thing on the Green Party platform is the recognition of indigenous peoples and, and requiring that um, every part of the platform incorporates the involvement of First Nations, of, of Indian with the Métis, and making sure that they have an equal seat at the table for any negotiation, which would then include post-secondary education, or making them uh, eligible for the very same net zero tuition and the very same programs that are available to every, uh, every other Canadian. Mm -hmm. One of the, I had a chance to speak to uh, Chief Hill uh, a few weeks back, who said that um, there is a significant portion of the people in Six Nations who decline to participate in things like elections because they are a separate nation. First Nations are separate from, from the government of Canada. And so Canada needs to approach that from uh, what's called a nation to nation, um, uh, having it as a, first na as a nation to nation. Not that these are um, a, a subsection of, of Canadians, these are people who have their own nations and they need to be treated as such. And we're not seeing that handled that way by the government today either. So that's pervasive throughout the entire Green Party platform. The Green Party platform is, is based on the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. I don't know if you saw that, but... I noticed your pen. Yeah, I got a pen. Glad you recognize that. Yeah. So there are 17 items in there, and each of uh, the 23 platform items has uh, the identification of which of those Sustainable, mm -hmm. develop, uh, sustainable Development Goals are met by those particular platform mm -hmm. items. Mm -hmm. And recognition of indigenous peoples is, is right in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's great that the Green Party is doing, uh, it's making it to emphasize reconciliation. Um, we've spoken with our students from the Indigenous Human Services Office, um, both here in Brantford and as well in Waterloo, and um, obviously access to post-secondary is a big concern for them. Um, one of the things that was brought to our attention from the manager there was that um, the post-secondary student support program, or triple SP, mm -hmm. P triple SP, excuse me, um, funding for that program is actually capped at 2% annually. Um, but the growth in Indigenous students and Indigenous peoples has greatly exceeded that 2%. Um, I think the main concern there was this also covers not only tuition, but things like living expenses and textbooks. Um, and our students are asking the parties to do something to address the need, um, or address the need to access post-secondary. And I believe you touched upon that in your previous answer. But part of that is also the health and wellness of the students when they're here at school. Right. Um, they noted a need for some sort of holistic health and wellness services, um, both outside of Six Nations and even in Waterloo. Um, is the Green Party pledging any support for Indigenous youth um, with regard to mental health and physical well-being? Not to say what outside of yes, um, there is a, a, a plan for a national health care strategy which includes improving the mental health services. Uh, there are just not enough mental health professionals uh, anywhere in Canada today to meet the need. Um, indigenous students, First Nation students would certainly be able to take advantage of that just as any other Canadian would be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to have um, uh, complete health care. Uh, there's no health care above the neck. Right now we have no uh, dental care, we have no eye care, we have no vision care. And so those all need to be rolled into, um, probably into the OHIP plan. But the national health care strategy would ensure that it isn't just OHIP doing that in Ontario, it would be across uh, all of Canada, so that we have equivalent standards for health care across the entire country. So one, uh, one province, and, and health care is a contingent jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but to make sure that one province doesn't um, have less available health care than other provinces. So that would require equalization payments for earmarked specifically for health care. Uh, the other thing is pharmacare as well. I uh, also want to make sure that uh, Canadians have access to the medicines that they need. It's fine to go to the doctor, but the doctor will prescribe something and that's not covered under any uh, care plan today. So uh, Canada is the only country in OECD that has national health care without having national pharmacare as well. So, a little bit behind on that, try to fix that, and that would be accessible to religious students. In addition to that, the recognition that there are traditional uh, practices within the indigenous community is recognized by the Green Party, and so that would be included in the healthcare strategy. Mm -hmm. What part of the 
of the platform are you most passionate about or excited about? Uh, as is sometimes an inconsistent, but proportional representation. Right now, um, in any of the ridings, we have a, a single member pr a plurality. Whoever gets the most votes wins, and all the other votes for the candidates that don't win are pretty much discarded. They, they really don't count for anything. So in our riding today, I think we have seven or eight candidates running. If the votes were to be distributed equally, which is unlikely to happen, but you could have a situation where you've got uh, one candidate winning with 12.5% of the votes, and you know, the other 87.5% of the votes you know, who essentially voted against that one candidate uh, are, are discounted. Voting for a candidate who doesn't win doesn't achieve any additional representation in Parliament, and every vote should increase uh, representation in Parliament for the people that you've, uh, that you've voted for. So once proportionality is achieved, once proportional uh, uh, representation is implemented, you don't just see that the parties are equally represented in Parliament. You see better gender diversity, uh, uh, ethnic diversity, uh, better uh, representation from indigenous people better representation from young people. Uh, the age representation is, is more like what the actual population is. And there's no direct um, there's no direct mechanism that would ensure that, that would happen. Uh, there are some proportional representation systems that, that do actually guarantee uh, a particular spectrum of, of candidates. All, all the different methods for getting proportional representation result in proportionality. Um, the one that's generally rejected uh, by Canadians is the closed list system. That's the one where, I, where you can actually determine that your slate of candidates is going to be uh, equally divided between the men and women. That's what, uh, there's gender balance. That's called a, a zipper list. So one man, one woman, one man, one woman. Um, and by the same token, you can ensure that you've got uh, an indigenous person or a, a foreign-born person. Uh, colonialist um, in the list, but having the parties choose the candidates is not well liked by the voters. Uh, the voters want to vote for the candidates themselves, they don't want to vote for the candidates to be assigned by the parties, which is exactly the situation we find ourselves in today. The parties, through the um, electoral district associations, actually choose the, uh, the candidate who represents them. So we do have a list, a list of one for each of the parties. Um, but there are ways of, of designing the ballot so that um, the voters can themselves choose from a pool of candidates who they want to represent the party and who they want to represent themselves locally. So that's a, a long answer for uh, it's, it's proportional representation of that reform mm -hmm. that I'm particularly passionate about. That's what got me into politics about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I started out with Fair Vote Canada, the Waterloo Region chapter, which is pretty mm -hmm. unactive. And there was a, a huge uh, Laurier and the University of Waterloo student Fair Vote contingent mm -hmm. at the time, who were out canvassing and uh, distributing literature. It was a badly handled referendum in that there wasn't enough literature available for every household. We, the Fair Vote volunteers, went out to the households to distribute literature, and we ran out. There just wasn't enough to go out. So the literature wasn't being distributed by the government, so they weren't making the information available to the public. It was left to uh, you know, passionate grassroots groups to, to make that happen. And then there wasn't an effort to begin with. So it was badly handled. Um, I would like to see a, uh, an implementation of proportional representation for the next election. And then shortly after that, have maybe two or three election cycles with that system, and then have the referendum to say, do you like this, or do you want to go back to what we had before? Mm -hmm. uh, rather than asking with a referendum and that generally doesn't come out well because of you know, the lack of information available, rather than having a referendum first and then trying to implement what's been done in the, in the, in the uh, referendum. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's my passion, uh, electoral reform. Mm -hmm. And once electoral reform is, is in place, you'll see that all the different issues, the climate change issues, the healthcare issues, the, uh, the housing issues, uh, something we haven't actually touched on yet, but there's a housing strategy for the Green Party as well, which would mm -hmm. definitely affect students. All those different issues then get the attention of all the parties. And so legislation that gets passed tends to be a lot longer lasting because all the parties have had a hand in crafting that. And you get a, a much wider spectrum of ideas that get represented. And so you get better health care, you get better housing, you get better um, educational uh, programs because that wide spectrum of people are all represented and can contribute. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for such a comprehensive answer. Yeah. <laughs> your passion is very much clear.